the dawn of the first century, what would later be the first century, God's people waited. They had been waiting for generations for God to deliver them and establish a new covenant. That new covenant would deliver them. As they were, a foreign, in fact, a pagan power dominated them. Dominated them politically, dominated them militarily. It's Rome. And they, have a, they had a vivid reminder of that every time they saw Roman soldiers around. Every time they considered the fact that King David's throne sat completely empty. Thinking back to 2 Samuel 7. Had not God promised that a descendant of David would forever sit on that throne? And yet David's throne sat empty. God's people waited in silence. Do you know what I mean by that when I say they waited in silence? God had granted Israel the privilege of being the vessel through which he brought his word, the Holy Scriptures. They were the keepers of the Scriptures. To them belonged the patriarchs and the prophets who, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had written the Scriptures, what we call our Old Testament. And yet, as we look at the setting of the Christmas story, they had been waiting in silence for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. No prophet. No new revelation. But they had hope and they held firmly to their hope. They waited with expectation for God to send the Messiah, the anointed one, who would redeem them. They held on to the promises of the scriptures. The scribes searched the scriptures for the prophecies. Where would the Messiah be born? And so on. The people wondered when God would fulfill his new covenant, would bring in the new covenant, and when God would redeem his people. Well, let's, let's read that story where God broke the silence. Go to Luke with me, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. We see this marvelous story of God breaking that silence. We're going to begin with Luke chapter 1, verse 26. We're going to be looking at six phases of this Christmas story. First here we see when the angel visits Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and is in the sixth month with her who was barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Such incredible faith we see here demonstrated in Mary. And understandably, she's shocked at first, frightened. Notice this is the common occurrence when angels show up. These are mighty creatures. And they, she's frightened. The angel says, don't worry, you found favor with God and gives her this wonderful message. And at the end, although she, she has grounds for asking the questions that she does, it's a reasonable question. And the angel explains to her, Nothing will be impossible with God. The Holy Spirit is doing this work. And she says, let it be as you've said. Basically, she's saying, amen. May it be so. 
And so we, we acknowledge this wonderful faith in Mary, this beautiful picture of God's grace in her life. Uh, when, when Protestants talk about Mary, they start getting a little nervous. They think about Roman Catholicism and, and the veneration of Mary and so on. Uh, although we, we don't want to go to that extreme, obviously that is an extreme. But we acknowledge her faith and the favor found in her and the way that God used her. Let's look at this beautiful response of praise that she gives in verse 46. This song of exaltation, chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will be blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. For he has shown strength with his arm. He has created or he has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and his offspring forever. This beautiful song of praise that she gives. Again, showing all the more, you know, the, uh, we're going to see more of this. You know, the, the song we hear around the holidays, Mary, did you know? Well, she knew a lot more than we usually give her credit for. She gives this beautiful praise, knowing that what is happening in her, what has already indeed happened in, in her through the power of the Holy Spirit is incredible. Indeed, the most profound miracle of all of Scripture, of all of history. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. Notice both of them are David and, or excuse me, Joseph and Mary. Verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son. They wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place in the inn. So here we see the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. This is the classic Christmas scene, right? Well, we see it depicted in nativity scenes. Maybe you have one in your home. You see them uh, at churches. This is the classic Christmas scene. And yet, because of that, we can miss the significance of what's happening here. We can become sort of numb to it, immune to it. It just becomes, a, sadly, just a sort of holiday scene for us. But in this picture, God has come to earth. This is the most profound of all biblical miracles, all miracles in history. Think about this. This is the God of the cosmos being born and laying seemingly helplessly in a manger. Let that sink in for a moment. The God who created all that exists, all of the galaxies that created this earth that we're on, that created everything that you uh, think about in in the sciences, all of the most amazing things that exist. This God comes in human flesh? Through the power of the Holy Spirit is conceived in Mary in a human? And it's not just that he seems to be human. He's genuinely human. He has fingers and toes and ears nostrils and he's born the same way that you and I were born he's lying there in a manger seeming to be helpless and yet he is fully God and fully man in one nature in one person that's miraculous that makes the miracles of the old testament and the others that we see later in Jesus' life seem to to pale in comparison this is the most profound of all miracles that we celebrate that we remember on this holiday. Go to verse 2. Excuse me, chapter 2, verse 8, where we just left off. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone all around them. 
And again, here we see, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, this is their song, verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Verse 19, I love this. But Mary treasured up those things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Again, there's this exaltation here, this incredible account. Having seen the nativity scene now, these shepherds are out there in the field just doing what shepherds do, watching over their flock. And angels appear in the heavens and give them a message. And then a whole host of angels in heaven glorifying God. As, as much as we want to acknowledge and say, look, the, the earth is, the people in the, in the world are beginning to notice this. The angels know exactly what's going on. Those in heaven have been waiting too for this glorious act of God. We see them praising God. Can you imagine that scene? Let this settle in. Think of the most amazing fireworks show, the most amazing jet show, all the things you can imagine. This would make those things look pathetic. In all of the hosts of heaven, the angels singing and glorifying the Lord because they know what is happening. I hope you sense the weight of what's happening too. The cosmos is taking notice. And yet, as I said, those on earth are also these shepherds who were not the highest of society. They're just sort of your blue collar workers out in the field are ushering. And it says they made in haste. They're, they're hurrying up to get over there. And yet we see another person who gives this very special notice of how the world is acknowledging what's going on. Verse 25, Luke 2, verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms, blessed them, and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother marveled in another, just another word to describe what they're thinking, how they're feeling. They marveled at what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What an incredible scene here. Simeon knew exactly who this child was. He's a holy man. He's been waiting. You notice that expectation that's there? He knows what's coming. The the people of Israel know. Notice when Herod, if we had read that account, when Herod hears about the king being born, the Messiah being born, who does he go to? He goes to the religious leaders, the scribes, and he knows that they think they know where the child is going to be born. He says, where is this child going to be born? And they know oh, it's in Bethlehem, of course. So you, you, you realize this background. The people of Israel are waiting, expecting. They're searching the scriptures. Simeon knew exactly who the child was, and he praises God for fulfilling his promises. And folks, that's what we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas. That's what we should be celebrating. 
God fulfilling his promises. He always does. Now, just quickly, turn with me to Matthew. One last passage to read. There's no better way to hear the Christmas story than to read it from the word of God itself. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. The last passage that we'll read. Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem was with him and assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. Here's the event I was just referring to. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem, Judea. For so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he said to them, or he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Oh, go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring word to me that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house, notice they're no longer in the manger scene, they're into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And they, and being warned in a dream, lots of dreams here, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. These wise men now, these sages from the east, we've seen the shepherds, sort of your your average blue-collar type guys. These are people coming from afar, a long distance, a distant country from the east. Uh, further out in Asia, no doubt. God supernaturally leads these men to go, and what do they do? They worship. A little baby? A little baby? Why, why would they be worshiping a little child? Well, they know exactly who he is. Even in his infancy, he's a king. Even in this helpful, helpless little state of you know, having to be uh, changed by his mother and nursed by his mother, probably a few weeks or so, maybe months after his, his birth, this is going on. They're still there in Judea, probably with some family of Joseph, since he was from there in Bethlehem, somewhere in the region. It's incredible. And they come and they worship him. And notice the gifts that they bring. Now, they don't mean anything to us. But these are gifts for a king. These are magisterial gifts that they give to him. These magi from the east know who this child is, and they, along with the angels, along with the shepherds, along with Simeon, are worshiping and saying God is fulfilling what he said he would. Folks, so here's the Christmas story. This is it. God coming to earth in human flesh, becoming one of us, I use the word story, but when I say that, I don't at all mean that it's just a story. It's not a tale. It's not a myth. This happened. They represent the beginning of the fulfillment of God's salvation, the world's hope for salvation. In Jesus, God became man like you and like me. Yes, he's divine, but he is human. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. Again, the greatest miracle of all history we see here. He fulfilled all the prophecies that foretold of his coming. We saw one here just a moment ago from Micah. And we read one earlier from Isaiah. So many others. This Jesus didn't stay a baby. Although we can joke about the movie Talladega Nights that pretends that he did. He didn't stay a baby. He grew up to be a man, lived a perfect life. The life that none of us ever could. And in obedience to the Father, according to his grace, he gave his life for the sins of humanity. 
I want to leave you with three repercussions of this event. We've seen the story, and now what does this story lead to? The first is that this Jesus, this God-man, came as the new Adam. We see this laid out so beautifully in Romans chapter 5. I encourage you to read it. We see it in other places in the scripture as well, hinted, but clearly laid out in Romans chapter 5, where Adam had failed in his relationship before God, sinning against him, he and Eve. Jesus lives perfectly in obedience to God. In Jesus, he restores the means of relationship between God and man that had been broken all the way back since the garden. Listen to this and let this sink in for a moment. You can know God. Christians say that a lot, and so again, that can become numb. But listen, the God who created all that exists, you can know him. I'm not just saying you can know about him. Certainly you can. I just read a whole lot. Certainly you can know about him, but I'm saying you can know him. You can have a relationship with him. And you may have never heard this, but the fact is, is you were made to know him. And there is part of you that will never fully function without that peace, knowing him. There's a part of you that will always be amiss and broken without knowing him. Because you were made to. You most do what you were made to do as a human being. Not when you sin, but when you know God. In our broken state without Christ, sin feels very natural. But it's not natural in the sense of coming from the beginning. It's not natural in the sense of why you were made. Knowing God is. And you don't need an, uh, any human intermediary. You don't need uh, some uh, sort of formula, some sort of magic potion. You can know God today. You can speak to him with your own mouth. So that's the first. Jesus came as the new Adam to restore that broken relationship. The picture of Adam walking through the garden, communing and chatting with God in Christ as the new Adam, that is available to you. You can know God. Secondly, Jesus removed the curse that had plagued humanity through all the ages. That curse is called sin. Without God's grace found only in Christ, you remain under that curse. So it's not as if Christ came, lived this life, died for us, and then that curse is broken automatically in all in the world. It comes by grace through faith and by following after him. And so as Christians as a church, that's what we represent is following after him. The curse has been broken and the Christian community, the church represents that. And that's available to you. Again, you can know Christ and you can have that sin removed. That guilt that we all carry and we all do. We can find ways to suppress it creatively. We can find ways to sort of numb ourselves. But that guilt within us can only be removed by this curse being broken. And that work has been made possible through Jesus Christ. That's available to you today. That's what we celebrate when we celebrate Christ coming. The initiation of that. The breaking of the curse. Again, the angels are celebrating the same thing. They know exactly what this means. Third, as with Jesus' first coming, God will be faithful to remember his people when he comes again. As Christians, we celebrate his first coming in the incarnation, what we call Christmas, a celebration of Christ, literally what that means. Yes, we remember his first coming, but we never forget the fact that he's coming again. And we as Christians pray, come Lord Jesus, come. We know that the curse has been broken and yet we wait for the final consummation, the final finalizing, if you will, in his second coming. And so if God was faithful the first time, we can trust that he'll be faithful again. God is never late. You realize that? He comes in what the scriptures call the fullness of time. And that's what happened here. Again, they waited hundreds of years between the closing of what we call our Old Testament, the prophets expecting Jeremiah 31, this new covenant. And then this gap happens and then the silence is broken and he comes in the perfect, the fullness of time. He will come again. 
He was faithful the first time. We as his people trust knowingly with all confidence that he will come again. And we celebrate that. So when we celebrate Christmas, we're always looking toward Easter and the cross. And at Easter, we're always looking forward to his return. We need a holiday for that. The church dropped the ball on that one. (laughs) Most of you will be celebrating Christmas this week, presumably. Many of you will be. If you do, celebrate this story. This story is worthy of being celebrated. In whatever way you celebrate. Don't celebrate some vague, secular, consumerist holiday. That's not worth celebrating. We get enough of that throughout the year. This story is worth celebrating. Christ has come. The new Adam has come. The curse of sin is broken. He has come once. He is coming again. That is worth celebrating. And regardless of whether or not, maybe you don't celebrate a formal Christian or a formal Christmas holiday for reasons of your own conscience, whether or not you do, all Christians celebrate this story because our hope rests in this story. The story is the coming of our Savior. God became human conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit. He fulfilled all the messianic prophecies. We could spend hours and hours going through these. He fulfilled them all. He lived a perfect life and he gave that life for people who had rebelled against him. What mercy, what grace. This message came to the Jews. We see it here, but then it goes out to all. Notice what Simeon said, a light to the Gentiles. That message is for you, it's for me, it's for this community, it's for your friends, for your neighbors, for your family. Salvation is here for all people. It's available here, it's available now. For all who will come to Christ, he will welcome them. And he will not cast them out. For all who repent of their sins, meaning they turn away from them and follow after Christ in faith, they will be saved and they will have eternal life. This new life began with Christ being proclaimed through the angel to Mary, the birth of the king of kings in Bethlehem. But this king now sits, having been resurrected and ascended to heaven, he now sits at the right hand of the Father as our advocate, saying, they're good, they're with me. I have broke the curse over them. One day soon. He'll come again. As I said, he came the first time. And when he came the first time, he came in complete humility, didn't he? Not born in some great palace, not born in the center of the empire. He was born in some relatively obscure town, Bethlehem. He's born in a manger. He's born to people who are not great and powerful in society. So he came in humility. He lived as a servant. He lived as a man of sorrows, as we saw recently. Complete humility. Irony, even. That's what the first coming looked like. But now, as the risen Savior, when he comes again, things will be quite different. In fact, they'll really be the opposite. He'll come as the judge of the world. I've heard so many times, and I know you have too in pop culture, People say, oh, only, only God can judge me. Or I'll, I'll let God be my judge. That shouldn't be a comfort to you. <clears throat> if you're not in Christ, that's not good for you. And his justice is perfect. He knows all things. He knows those things we've done that no one else knows. St. Nick may be keeping a list and checking it twice. Jesus doesn't have to do that. He knows all things. So when he comes as judge, all those who are with him, all those who have had their faith in him have been forgiven and will spend eternity with him. But all those who have rejected his message, have rejected his gospel, they'll face judgment. And so as we celebrate the first coming as joyous, the second coming, it depends where you are as to how you celebrate that or whether you fear that. If you're not in Christ, you have great grounds for fear there. I don't say that with any sort of high-handed way. I say that with with fear for you. If you are not in Christ, he's coming. Again, he came the first time. He will come again. 
Your only grounds for hope are faith and repentance to which he calls you right now. Now is the time which you can respond to that. There will come a time when it's too late. And that's when he comes as judge. And so I plead with you this morning. This is an urgent calling. There's nothing more urgent that I could call you to right now other than this. If you are not in Christ, if you have not repented of your sins, put your faith in him, believing in this story and following after him. If you are not doing that, you can do that today. And I urge you to. This is a first order question. There are certain questions in life that are important. Who should I marry? What kind of job should I work? Um, How many kids do I want to have? There are a lot of important questions in life. But all of those that we could think of pale in comparison to this because this is eternity. Even if you live to 100 years of age, that is a short time in comparison to eternity. According to the word of God, I only have grounds to say, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus now. Put your faith in him. Repent of your sins. There is no other hope. There is no other hope. Jesus Christ says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And now is the time to respond in that. And if you come, he welcomes you with open arms. This is not, this is not a call to people who are good, who look good on the outside. This is not a call to people who uh, come from a church background. This is a call to all people for all who will come. Every color, every age, every socioeconomic class, to all people, come. Now is the time to come. If you have not put your faith in Christ, I urge you today, would you come and talk to me at the conclusion of the service? Come and talk to another one of our elders, please. And for those of you who are in Christ, we celebrate this holiday with great expectation. We thank Christ for coming, and yet we look all the more to his return. Amen.